Good morning and welcome to Grace Bible Church. It's so good to see all of you today. And uh, you're smiling so nicely, which is really nice. And all of you again today is my wife, Michelle, <laughs> because we want to get this out to some of you who might not have the opportunity to uh, be with us. But today we are going to be in Mark chapter 6. You may remember last week we were looking at snapshots of Herod's life and the kinds of things that led to his spiraling downfall into a guilt complex and the, if history is correct, the total futility of his life as he spent the remainder of his life in exile when he thought perhaps he would be rewarded. So looking at Mark chapter 6 and verse 30, the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said unto them, Come yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. So they departed into a desert place by ship privately. And the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot out of the cities and out went them and came together unto him. Skendalizo. I might have slightly mispronounced that. It reminds me of the word scandal in English. But the Greek, skendalizo, to put a stumbling block or impediment in the way upon which another may trip or fall, to cause a person to begin to trist, distrust one whom he ought to trust and obey, to find an occasion of stumbling in a person, to be offended in a person, to see in another what one disapproves of and what hinders one from acknowledging his authority. Scandalizo or scandal. <laughs> Years ago, when I was a teacher, occasionally I'd like to mess with the kids a little bit, the guys, and uh, I might stick my foot out and retract it, obviously. I wouldn't cause them to stumble on purpose, but... Uh, there was an old saying from a former teacher that I had, and that was, uh, have a nice trip, see you next fall. And I always like to mess with the kids that way. But there is a real scandal when you reject the truth. And if a person wants to reject the truth, I have, my belief is they forsake the ability to reason. I saw a clip from an outfit that was going after another group, and everything that they had to say about this other group was patently false. Emotionally and with conviction, they preached what they felt was the right thing. And this, by the way, was not a saved group. This was just a typical group that's out there. And in doing so, every single statement that they made was patently false. But they wanted to convince you that they were true and that this outfit was so terrible. Scandals, scandalizo. Finding ways to make people stumble. Sometimes we want to live out of our emotions and not out of the truth. And we have to get to the point in life where we take nothing else but God's word yes. reason for what we do. It is our foundation for what we believe, the Bible is our foundation for what we practice in our life. And in doing so, what we practice is entirely depending upon God to help us to practice the right thing. Romans one twenty five puts it this way for people who will reject God. They change the truth of God into a lie, kind of like the broadcast that I heard. It was an outright lie to try to defame another group. They change the truth of God into a lie, kind of like our culture has decided that it is elevating its morals above God. And we find out that indeed our morals are about hopeless. It was John Adams that said something to the effect that our Constitution is wholly incapable of governing those who will neither be religious nor will be moral people. And I thought that was an interesting quote, and I put it out there uh, in listening to a, to a broadcast by one of the news media. And somebody 
out there said, the Constitution was guaranteed to protect us from religious and moral people. Well, my friends, that is obviously an outright misrepresentation of what John Adams had said about 200 years ago. We are very good at dismissing the truth and replacing it with what we feel is right. And in doing so, we live out a lie. And in doing so, like Romans would say, we worship man more than we worship God, who is blessed forever. Man is not blessed forever. If we forsake God, if we have no fear of God, then we are going to end up in the destruction to which this world system has been condemned since the days of Adam. Now, I'm sure there are those who would love to snicker at it because, frankly, there have been folks like that ever since the gospel first came out. Let me inform you that the people who were scoffers in the days of the Apostle Peter and in the days of Jesus Christ have been in hell for 2,000 years. And if you want to join that crowd, go for it. But let me tell you something. It is not a joke. Hell is real. And everything about it that Jesus spoke about in Luke chapter 16 when he spoke about a certain man that lifted up his eyes being in torments, don't think it was a Sunday school picnic. But you'll believe what you'll believe because you have elevated your truth above God. But there are some, there are some who have said, no, you know what, I'm looking around at the world's truth. and You know what, it's stable as water. I think I'd like to stand on a rock instead of build my house on sand. And so I need a firm foundation. And there is no other foundation laid than that which is given. That is our Lord Jesus Christ. Turn to Christ while you can. You no reason that anybody should end up in a place called hell. But for those who will change the truth of God into a lie and will worship man more than they will worship God, there is no alternative. Hebrews 3.12 has a word to say to us, and I want to I want to mention something. Charles Darwin, everybody knows about him, said that the belief was the most complete distinction between man and lower animals. And somebody observed, if this is true, that belief is the most complete distinction between man and lower animals, it would also suggest that a lack of faith on man's part, a lack of believing in God, puts him at the same level as an animal. Now, I seem to recall an interview many years ago where a pastor had been interviewing someone that represented immorality and he said we can't live like animals and the man boastfully said i am an animal well no you're not you are made in the image of god that is bible truth that's where i get my definitions from and frankly doesn't matter if i get my definitions from there or not what does matter is that god laid down the truth and it is our part to accept it and say, okay, I get this. I get what God has said. Or like Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12 would say, you take heed, you be careful, you look out, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. I'm guessing that God takes unbelief seriously, and so should we. You know, you watch the kids up grow up, And I think about the story of Jesus and how people are dismissing him. Oh, he's just that Nazarene. We saw him grow up. And I still have memories in my mind as I think of young people who have become adults and have families of their own now, who were older than my own children. And I remember them playing on the floor at 100 Richard Avenue a good many years ago with their transformers in elementary school. And it was very interesting. Parents would drop them off and they all had their transformers. And if you remember such things, you're going back to the late 80s or mid 80s. But you know what? As you think about those kids that were kids then in the late 80s, if you do not treat them right, you may be doing the same thing as the townspeople did to Jesus. Because there's a hometown bias. The Bible says a prophet is without honor in his own country. And people can take you for granted because you're a known quantity in your hometown. Or as the expression that you're so familiar with, familiarity breeds what? 
contempt. And so many people, and Christ in particular, finds this as he is ministering near his hometown. And as he's in Nazareth, people outright rejects Christ. But one fellow said it best, Philip Brooks, he said, familiarity breeds contempt only with contemptible things or among contemptible people. However, Jesus Christ was never contemptible. He was the person that told you the truth, and he was the person that healed your disease. He was the person in this passage, and it really I think of his life is the compassion that he had. In our lives, do we have compassion? I got to tell you, it's, it's a rough go sometimes to have the kind of compassion that we should for other people. But if our master had that kind of compassion for everybody, shouldn't we? Shouldn't we care what happens to people around us? I certainly should think so. It's a good mark in your life if you're doing something for somebody and it's nobody else's business and they know about it. And you know about it, but not the rest of the world. Well, there was a tourist once and he went into an art gallery and he didn't have much taste for art. And as he's walking out, he tells the guard, he says, I don't see anything special here. And the guard said something. He says, it is not the pictures that are on trial here, but the visitors. The young man evidently had no taste whatsoever. Yet Jesus here, obviously bringing on a great deal of compassion to every situation that he finds himself in. Now, you might remember early out in the story, Jesus sends his disciples all throughout the land and they come back to him. And it is at that time that he asks them or tells them, hey, it's time for you to take a break. You need to come apart. Incidentally, I think there is something to be said for taking care of that body of yours and that spirit of yours. You need rest. I would also say this. There is a balance in this because none of us need rest all the time. None of us need to take a complete time out for ourselves. In fact, I find that the disciples have gone all throughout the land. They've taken a long journey and they have earned a well-earned rest. And it's interesting as they come apart and as they take time out, it must have been a short time out that there are still faith lessons for these people. Rest a while to cause or permit oneself to cease from labor and to recover and to collect his strength. Now, depending upon how you tick in the world, you might need a little bit more than somebody else, but we all have to have a little bit of rest along the way, or we may find ourselves, quote, burning out. I like what one person said. It was Kenneth Woost, and uh, I, I love how he goes through the Greek. Most of the definitions I give you uh, come from that source. And he said this. He said, the devil would wear us out before our time if we could. Why? Because we want to share the gospel, and we want to share the truth. And if there's anything the devil doesn't want in the world today, it would be God's truth. But I got it secret for you. It doesn't matter what happens. God's truth will always go out. And there will always be people who will reach out in faith and in complete trust look to the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation. And wherever you find such a person, <laughs> you'll find God is faithful. Always, always faithful. Interesting. It was a short-lived rest, by the way, of those disciples. And it reminds me, years ago, and I don't remember who it was. It was somebody I knew at the time. He got married, and uh, he had a little brother. And uh, <laughs> as, as they finished the wedding and as they're taking off well, to their honeymoon, there, were, there was a bunch of stuff in the back seat. I think it was balloons. And they also planted little brother in amongst the balloons. So that about an hour or two down the road, guess who pops up? There's the little brother there. Talk about being inconvenienced. Uh, but as far as Christ is concerned, he's never inconvenienced. He never quits. He is praying and earnestly representing you right now with what he sacrificed, which is entirely himself. All the pain, all the agony, everything it took, to pay the price 
for your sin and my sin and the sins of the whole world. Well, point number one I wanted to point out is that Jesus will meet the needs of those who need rest. And there are times you need rest and there are times that God has said, hey, this is your time out. This is, you need a break. And he's gonna give you such a break. And this compassionate heart is looking after you and he's not interested in seeing you work yourself to the bone. He is interested in seeing you do what he wants you to do, but not to wipe yourself out. You're one person. And Jesus, verse 34, when he came out, saw much people and was what? Moved with compassion. I do not know how many times in my college years I heard this message about Christ moving, being moved with compassion. Because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto them and said, this is a deserted place, the time is far past. Send these people away that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. Verse 37, he answered and said unto them, you give them something to eat. You gotta feel the pressure now. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Do you feel the pressure yet? Because you're supposed to be Jesus to the entire world. Interesting here that Jesus has them sit down in groups of hundreds and fifties. You know, God is a very orderly God. I remember the story of the Israelites as they were out in the wilderness and as they were there, they were all facing the temple of God. It didn't really matter where that, where that tribe was. They were all facing the temple of God, whichever side they happened to be on it, because God is an orderly God. I'm reminded of Paul's words in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, where he says, let all things be done with decently and in order. God is a God of order. And that's why every time you have confusion, may I say riots, you are not looking at order. You're looking at disorder. The French Revolution speak of a time of disorder. Marxist regimes like those of Hitler, regimes that deny God, as there are still regimes in the world today, often you will find a great degree of death a great degree of the denial of human rights, let alone the freedom to worship God according to the dictates of your conscience. And there are people in this country that would be willing to take away your freedoms as well. But you know what? I'm reminded that under Rome, things were not exactly good, were they? And our times may be getting a little more difficult, but you know what? If you truly have a relationship with God, there is nothing more important to you in the universe than your walk with God. You can take a lot of things away from a man, but you cannot take away what's on the inside. And when you walk with God and you know you've walked with God, nobody can take that away. God is a God of order. And he takes what little is given him. We have very little to offer the God of the universe who speaks and the world's come into existence. And we're talking all these amazing things that we get to see, all the beautiful things that God has made. It's amazing what our father has made. And he is the God that is the God of order. And who am I and what do I have that I can give him? Well, I tell you what, I can try to tell him that I love him freely from my heart. You can try to tell him that you love him freely from your heart as well. You can only do that, though, if you're walking with God. It's very difficult to tell, tell someone, I love you freely from my heart, but you know what? I'm rejecting everything you did for me. This stuff about the cross, this stuff about resurrection, that just doesn't register with me, but I just want to give my own little offering to you, God. And you know what God has to say? Sorry. There is no other way to God the Father but through Jesus. John 14, 6. We do things God's way. Incidentally, you never told your parents, if you had good parents, that, hey, I'm going to do things my way. That would never, ever fly. Certainly not in my childhood. That would never fly. I'm surprised 
sometimes when I watch families, it seems like they follow their kids into whatever their kids do. If their kids are going to go into some wild church situation, well, there they go right after them. And I got to tell you something, I'm just not like that. I, I want to worship God according to dictates of my conscience. If I can't be true to what I have learned from the Bible and what I've taken in here is taught by the Holy Spirit of God, there's not much character here. And so I will worship God according to the dictates of my conscience. And many times it's going to be, be still and just know that I'm God. I won't just follow people anywhere. But, you know, one of the big things about Christ that really stands out is his heart of compassion. He so loved people and he so loved you. D.L. Moody, great evangelist of the 1800s, the late 1800s. And in Chicago, kids would go to his church from all over the place and they'd walk quite a distance to get there. And one person asked a kid, why is it that you walk all the way across Chicago for all practical purposes just to come to this church? There are other churches closer to you. And the boy said, he said, it's because they love a person here. And you know what that means to be part and parcel of what we're about. Do we care about people? People need to see Jesus. They don't need to see us. Disciples, you feed them. Oh boy, it's all over here. Christian, you be Jesus to the rest of the world. Oh boy, it's all order. Oh, not really. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Would you just take yourself, would you just take your little five loaves and your little two fishes and would you just give yourself to Jesus and watch what he can do? Because it's about what Christ does in us and not what we do because we're such goody two-shoes. And frankly, if it's about us, that's all we are is goody two-shoes. Not worth much, something that's very despicable. But if it will be Jesus in you, the hope of glory, then you can offer Jesus we were looking at Ephesians just recently, last Sunday night, and part of what really stood out to me in the last chapter, in the first chapter, chapter one, the last few verses was that Christ being the head of his body, let's answer the question, who is Christ's body? You are, if you place your faith in him. You are Christ's body, all right, and he's the head of that body, and he is filled up when that body is doing what he expects them to do. What does Christ expect the body, the church, to do, you to do? He expects you to be him to the rest of the world because you are his physical body here on earth. Tall order, huh? Feed them. Do you have enough? No. But you have God. So yes, you have more than you need. Because the same person who was able to take those five loaves and two fishes is able to take you and is able to use you. And if, the only, if only one person puts their faith in Jesus because you were on this planet, that's one person that'll be in heaven. Sometimes I think today's kind of tough to get people to understand that God cares about them and that he wants their soul and he wants to share heaven with them. I trust God, but the demand is too high for us. It cannot be done outside of having a true walk with God. So first, Jesus meets the needs of those who need rest. But secondly, Jesus meets the needs of those who need physical and spiritual nourishment. I used to work at the mission in Fairmont from about 1995 to about the year 2000, 2001 at what time I first became a pastor of a small church. That seems to be my life calling, and that's okay, because if that's what God wants for me, that's what I'm willing to do. I don't envy big big, big situations, but I knew there was a need that needed to be met here in town, and so I stepped up and I did my part. I'm not much. I'm just five loaves and two small fishes. <laughs> and I'm sure my folks could fill in the blank with another expression or two that might be appropriate. But my God, he's incredible. And my God so loves me and my God so loves you and he wants to do in your life what only he can do. So that takes us to the next verses then, verse 45. Straightway, he constrained his disciples. Hey, let's get in the ship. Let's go to the other side before to Bethsaida. And he sent 
away the people. And when he sent them away, he departed into the mountain and pray. And when the evening was come, the ship was in the midst of sea, and he alone was on the land. And he saw them. Park it there for a second. I just, I just love that part. Because he's nowhere near them, but he sees them physically. Physically, according to our senses, Jesus is not right next to us. Rather, he's in heaven representing us, but he may as well be here as far as we're concerned because Jesus sees us right where we are. There's so many people doing things they ought not to do, and they sort of dismiss or try to forget that God is pretty much right there. He's everywhere. He sees what's going on. I'm not going to attempt to get away with things that God doesn't want me to get away with because God's right here. He's right here with me. And he's also in Seattle. I had a picture <laughs> opening up of, of a sunset in Seattle. And I asked if I could repost that because it was such a beautiful... I used to love those pictures as the sun would break, especially over the Olympica Mountains across Puget Sound when I was a boy in Seattle looking from our 21st Avenue location next to the Sherrits. I miss those days. I miss seeing those sights. And yet, the beauty is, God is over there with my friends right now. I still have one or two friends left over there, I think. <laughs> Been many, many years. Well, Jesus saw them, and Jesus sees you right now, wherever you are. He represents you. And I think he wants to teach his disciples a lesson here. Guess what? I won't always be with you. Remember last time I was in the boat with you and I was there and I said, peace, be still in the boat. I was in the boat. But you know what? The time's coming when I'm not physically going to be with you, but I want you to know that I see you. So your Savior who is in heaven can meet your needs every bit as easily as if he is in the boat with you and the disciples are going to need that. Because before long, Jesus will be in heaven and they will be taking the gospel into all the world and preaching it to everybody they can find and they will pay with their lives. But you know what? Jesus is with them all the way. He gives them his power for each moment. And my friends, that's all you need. So they all see him, and this is interesting, Out, and they think that it's a ghost and they cry out and they see him. They're troubled. Immediately he talks with them and says, be of good cheer, don't be afraid. And he went up with them into the ship and the wind stopped and they were just unbelievably amazed. Beyond measure, they wondered this. And they forgot about the miracle where he just fed 5,000 people and they were full. Jesus meets the needs of those who need rest. Maybe you need rest. Jesus meets the needs of those who need physical and spiritual nourishment. Maybe that's you. Jesus meets the needs of those who need safety and encouragement. Maybe that's you. Jesus, by the way, seems to be echoing something that happened before. Ever experienced deja vu? Man, I saw this someplace. Where did I see this? Well, the same thing is happening here. This is not the only time where bread has been multiplied and given to people. How about the manna that fell from heaven? The two covenants, there's an Old Testament and there's an old law. You could call it the law of Moses and people looking at Moses and what happened in the wilderness. They got bread from heaven. Who was the figurehead of that? It was Moses. Here comes Jesus feeding the 5,000 on one occasion, feeding the 4,000 on another occasion. That was the first thing. That was the law. That was the teacher. Jesus Christ is the real thing. He is the lamb that takes away the sin in the world. He is the New Testament, and he has sealed this deal with his own blood because everything was poured out by God for you. He got that kind of God that loves you that much. It all had to be taken care of. You see, there is absolutely no escape for the penalty of the things that you do wrong. There are only one of two options. 
Option number one, Jesus will take that penalty for you and he already has and he cried out, it's finished, God has accepted this sacrifice and we have the proof of it by a body that has never been found in Jerusalem. All the Romans had to do was to find one little body that was sealed and they failed. That's because God is much more powerful than a mere man. That's who I'll put my trust in. That's who I believe in. I believe in Jesus. Risen from the dead. What is it that would change those disciples' lives from people who are scared to death? That they would be next on the Romans' hunting list and on the hunting list of the Jews because they represented some sort of heretical sect and then now, instead of being scared, they're out preaching in the streets of Jerusalem. And oh, the leaders are being care- killed. But who cares? We're going to get the gospel out. It doesn't matter if we're like lambs to the slaughter. People need to know God's truth. Now, there are some people that have heard it and have rejected it. Some people will do that. Jesus said, look, there's four kinds of ground and only one of them is any good. The gospel is like a seed that's planted into the ground and that seed will grow and turn into a beautiful, fruitful plant. But there are three other kinds of ground out there where you try to plant the gospel and you may as well just, but you can't. You don't know what kind of ground you have. You don't know if that person has faith or not. You don't know if that person will grow. You don't know. We don't know anything. I just know this much that for a man to believe, it takes God's miracle of opening his heart. And God does that time and time again. God did it with me. God did it with many of my friends, many of my relatives. And God can do the same for you. Yes, they can be fed. They can be taken care of. And you can find as you walk with God, the person who, even if he's in heaven, he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. The other thing that the other thing that Moses did, you know, he took them through the Red Sea. Well, there's Jesus walking on the water an amazing thing that God does. You see, he is that new promise. He is that new promise to you that God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son that if you will place your faith in him, you won't perish in this place called hell. You won't perish in this place called a lake of fire which burns with fire and brimstone for eternity. You won't perish that way by the person who is able to destroy both your body and soul because you have dared to say, I don't want you. It takes a lot of gall to look at God and say that. And Jesus said, I love him anyway. I'm going to lay down my life if anybody will believe me. If anybody will place their faith in me. And I'm not talking about sheer just head knowledge. Herod had head knowledge, didn't do him a lick of good. He needed to place his faith in Jesus Christ. If you don't trust God, you're going to be afraid. All these disciples, they're afraid. They've forgotten a thing or two. They're looking out there and they didn't have movies to watch back in those days, but they may as well have had movies. They certainly did have some things that could scare them to death, like watching demon-possessed people. And as they see this figure coming out across the water, they're crying out. They are scared stiff. Oh, but it's a good thing to know that he comes on alongside us anyway. And he says, hey, don't be afraid. It's just me. (laughs) It's amazing as you look at Christ, what he does for you. The Greek was phantasma or phantom, an apparition, a specter. And they cried out, and this is a just a scream. They're scared to death. And Jesus steps inside and he says, Don't be afraid. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Jesus gives you peace. Jesus takes away your fear. And let me say this much it'd be a far better thing for you to fear God and to be able to face life unafraid than to not fear God and pretty much be afraid of everything. We've got all these people running around with masks. I'm one of them, okay? I'm a transplant patient, so I'm one of them. And I'll wear a mask because I listen to the advice of good people. 
But a lot of people are afraid, hey, am I next to get this thing? Well, you know what? I got this much figured out. My day to be with God is in God's timing, and there is nothing I will do one way or the other that will postpone or change that. I will live as cautiously as I can because there's no sense in saying, hey, I want to live radically. I don't jump off cliffs. Jesus didn't jump off a cliff. I see what some people do flirting with death, and I'm thinking to myself, boy, that doesn't look like something you really want to do. And many people die prematurely because of that. But I'm not terribly worried. Whatever happens out there, things change. So much has changed. I used to love to teach BAM, but am I teaching BAM this fall? Sure doesn't look like it because of the changes that have happened. Music used to be a huge part of my life. It still is a huge part of my life, but do I get to use it right now? Well, no, now is not the time. That's okay. Everything comes by God. Everything that we have, everything that's on this earth will burn up with fervent heat. That's the Bible. And you can say, well, yeah, there is a death of the universe out there somewhere. Yeah, at least 1,007 years from now, by my figuring. But I don't know the time. All I know is that you better not have your treasures in this world because all the things that are in this world will be taken away one at a time until ultimately there you are on your deathbed and you will lose your own life and the relationships that you have with your family and vice versa. They'll lose the opportunity to be with you. Unless. Unless they know Jesus. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not looking for the undertaker. I know him, I think. But I am looking for the upper taker. I am looking for the Lord Jesus. The other thing I'd like to say, besides the fact that you don't have to live in fear and that Jesus can meet you, is that he can give you folks your own private miracle. There in the boat, only 12 people there, they receive a personal miracle from God. Now, if you're a Christian, you know what I'm talking about. There have been people you prayed for, and praise the Lord, he did something wonderful for them. Or there may have been a big storm that was heading your way, and it threatened to do something, and you prayed, and you know what happened when you prayed? The Lord sort of split that storm up. I often pray, I think about Jim Hall sitting up on top of one of our highest hills. Boy, would he make a great sail through the skies if the wrong kind of storm hit him there. I often pray for Jim, and I often ask the Lord, would you protect him? Because we looks like we got a quite a radical little storm going on here, and I'd just like to see your protection, because he's kind of up there where the winds are higher and could do a whole lot more damage. And it's amazing to me to see how God just step by step. Now, some atheist out there says, well, now, isn't that interesting? You know, I prayed and and, and this didn't happen. Well, I pray God's your will be done. I'm not saying that, that just praying is definitely a yes from God. I don't believe that our, our relationship. If you ask for something from your parent when you are a kid, there are some things they will give you because you've asked. And if you don't ask, chances are there are some things that you would not get from your parent. But if you do ask, there may be some reasons that your parent has for saying, no, this would not be good for Johnny at this time. And likewise, the same thing is true of your Heavenly Father. He knows exactly what is good for you and, frankly, what is good and will glorify the family name, which is the name of God and the name of Jesus Christ. And there is no name any higher than that. There are a lot of good families. I have a lot of respect for parents whose kids turn out right, kids who are respectful. But i got to say this. There's a great family, and it's God's family, and you have to have a lot of respect for God. What he's done to bring that family together took everything he had, and he gave it anyway, because he loves you. And he's God, so he's going to win, and he's going to win you. Well, now, verse 53 when they passed over, they came into the land of Gennesaret and drew to the shore, and they were come out of the ship. And straightway, the people there, they knew him, and they ran around that whole region and carried in beds those that were sick where, they, where he was. And wherever he went, villages, cities, country, they laid the sick in the streets and brought him that they might touch it. But the border of his garment and as many as touched him were made whole. 
Jesus meets your needs if you need rest. Jesus meets your needs if you need physical and spiritual nourishment. Jesus will meet your need if you need safety and encouragement. And Jesus never quits. He never quits. He always has time for you. And ministry, guys, because every believer is a minister. We all have the same great commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, I know there are some churches that say, how dare you share the gospel? Let me say such a church does not know anything about the great commission, evidently, because we're supposed to tell people about Christ. That's our first that's our first objective. That's what we are supposed to be doing. Jesus told us it wasn't a, hey, if you'd like to, I'd like you to go out there and tell somebody about me today. It was, you go, you tell, you make sure people know. Ministry never stops. But there are times when Jesus will say, it's time for you to take a little time out. And there are times for you when you're going to work because, hey, you got to work today. Your to-do list is huge and you're going to need your Savior's energy to accomplish that. Turn to Jesus. He never quits. And he's representing you right now. If you haven't placed your faith in Jesus, you are about one prayer away. And I don't, it's not the prayer that saves you. It is placing your faith in Jesus. It is resting all your weight upon him. Like sitting completely in a chair, trusting that that chair will hold you up. Would you trust Jesus with your soul? Would you trust Jesus to forgive you your sins and to come into you and to be your Savior because that's what God does by his Holy Spirit? And would you turn to Jesus and would you say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm asking you to save me from my sins. I'm trusting you to do what only you can do. And I don't want sin in my life. You don't want sin in my life. You know, might say, well, I haven't done that much wrong that I know of. Well, let me tell you something. It's not just what is done on the outside, but it's what happens in here. And there are things that you think in here because quite frankly, it's very hard to control what's in here. It's called your heart. The Bible calls it that, that inner you. And that's really the heart of the matter. What needs to be saved is your heart. It's desperately wicked. It can't help but curse at times. It cannot help but think thoughts that are not loving towards one's neighbor. It cannot help but constantly seek to encourage other people because frankly, our inner wanter thinks about me. It's very foreign to us to say, God, I want you first. Save me from myself. God, I want to be considerate towards my neighbor. Save me so that people would see you because I'm supposed to represent you. Save me, Jesus, from my sins. I know you died for me. I know you're risen and you're at God the Father's right hand and I'm just placing my faith in you. You are my trust. When you put your trust in Jesus Christ, these words are absolutely true. God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son that when you place your faith in him, you will never perish. But you, my friend, have everlasting life. Oh, there's so much for us to be thankful for. Look to Jesus, my friends. Trust him. Father, thank you for these people today, whoever it is that happens to be listening. I pray that our hearts would be completely focused upon you. Our world is geared towards, give me my rights. Give me what I want. You better embrace what I tell you. You better embrace. And I tell you something, Lord. I'm willing to embrace one thing. Your word and yourself. And transform me, even as I would ask that you transform the people that would listen to your word today. Thank you, Jesus, for meeting people's needs. Thank you, Father, for the compassion that you have for all of us and that you are willing to shepherd us and that you are willing to guide us each step of our lives. What a blessing. It is in Jesus' name we thank you and we praise you today. Amen.